no phone Don't need no speedy car to get me home Don't need no nothing, all I need is time for the simple life Ooh, go get your butt off of that lazy couch Put down the laptop and get out of that you are listening to KRXA 540 AM. I am Cynthia Fernandez, your host for this hour, and this is Simple Life. Each week we host an interview with one of the unheard voices of the Central Coast, an hour dedicated to story, life experiences, and perspectives close to heart. At the end of the show today, we have a special appearance. Isabella will be uh, here with us and sharing a book review. We're very happy to be in studio with Nancy Mellon, who is a local author. She's considered a global storyteller. She's also a psychotherapist. And this is the second half of the interview. We played the first half last week on March 30th, 2013. So if you're just joining us, you will be able to get that first half on the archive for Simple Life Radio. However, um, we want to welcome Nancy back in the studio. I'm sure that you're aware, Nancy, of Richard Louv. Yes. Okay, Richard Louv is an author of a couple of books. His first book was uh, The Last Child in the Woods, and then his second titled Nature Principle, and he suggests that because of all the technology and how complicated our lifestyles are currently, not only for children but also for adults, we need to balance our high-tech involvement with time and nature. You know, technology, you're very focused into detail, and it's pretty much all eyes and hands, and not a lot of your other senses are are being utilized, whereas time and nature is really the reverse. Mm. You know, all of your senses, the sights and smells, the feel of the breeze or the feel of the sun on your cheek, um, they're happening so quickly and so tightly woven together that you can't really differentiate it like you can a program of Angry Birds where there, it's much more linear in computer programming. And so I, I just wonder if you've had that experience yourself in terms of bringing balance to the whole person, how nature plays a part in that balance. Well, I, you know, I think primary nature the growing child needs to experience is the the whole human nature of the primary adults in their lives. And then there's the environment in which the adult moves. And if the adult, the primary caretakers, the role models do not notice the wind in the morning, do not breathe in the power of the moon with wonder, they cannot speak a, a poem or just exclaim patiently as the weather is changing and watch that or look again and again at the same tree with love and wonder and awe and if if we can't do that for them then we and we think well we turn them over to nature nature will be their healer and in certain ways of course that's always been true of children when they can go out into nature but as Richard Louv knows only too well there's so little safety left in the natural mm. world for children mm. well there's so little natural world I remember when I was a kid I, I mean even kindergarten I walked to school and so it was probably I. 15 blocks and yeah. there were several empty lots and empty houses to and from and places that we could just explore yes and now we we drop my granddaughter off at school at the steps of the school and we pick her up there it's just I know. and there's so much fear and and protection around the children and it's it's um on a massive scale i mean all through the world right now and the population explosion and this kind of a high rise removal from the natural world is just rampant in South America and China, you know, as it is in our country in some places, but even more so. Mm. Say, if you go to Sao Paulo, uh, where you can drive for a whole hour and everything is high rise, like a mythic landscape, and they forgot to make parks. Oh my. They just, they went into this main of building and they forgot about trees and parks 
And so those children are growing up in a virtual world. You know, and the families are living you know, on the 10th floor, the 24th floor, in a largely virtual life. And they're Please, because they don't have to be working so hard in nature to make their living. Mm. But the first generation, second generation, living in that way, they're going to have to find ways to recover from this. Mm-hmm. And so they will generate, you know, something amazing out of this, because otherwise they're not going to be able to survive. Yes, I, I would agree. So it's a it's a study in progress. It is. A, it's a it's a a, a weird and wonderful rejection of nature as an experiment that humanity is in right now. Mm-hmm. And now we see this n- new generation of young people, all, all they're all insisting on learning how to plant seeds and how to make their own gardens, and they're helping one another, and they're dreaming up these marvelous alternatives for solar energy and for making their solar cars and all of these things. Because... It's just organic to the human being. If, if the human being is going to be on this earth, we 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 must be here as a whole person. We're in studio today with Nancy Mellon. You're listening to Simple Life on 5:40 a.m. KRXA. Well, I think we're in balance when we're here as a whole person, and mm-hmm. I think that you know we have the benefit of uh, quantum physics and physics, and we learn that everything is connected. There's no separation between our physical bodies and the stars, uh, which we've never touched, but we have some of the same. But speaking of hands, you know, if the child stays stretching out their hand in love and wonder to touch the moon or to touch a star, to reach for the star, and to realize that their hand is like a five-pointed star, and that the star's forms are really living in their hands, in their feet, and that before they were born, just before that they were really in touch with their stars, you know, in the forming of their the mathematics of their body, and the shine of their body, and the sparkle of their eyes, then they get into that state of, oh, yes, well, my hands, I'm writing here, but I'm also, my hands are always in touch with the universe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very true. Mm. And so perhaps the rejection of nature could on some level be a rejection of our own nature. It is. In some aspect. It has become that. But then I think, and I wrote this book called Body Eloquence, because I think that we have to in the 21st century grow in the direction of rediscovering our bodies as a whole sacred environment that is really created out of the universe and to really learn that not as a esoteric concept concept, Mm. but as a reality what is your definition of a mentor well a mentor is a person who has the great privilege of being asked questions that they hope they have some kind of answer for, <laughs> but which they would love to offer to the usually the younger person who is questing for answers, or questing for guidance. But I think mentors are, the best of mentors are, are uh, just uh, profound students of life. And so uh, there's a joy of being in, in the exchange the curiosity and the the need for guidance and then the discovery that one has some guidance to offer and that we're willing to step into the role of the mentor that that help comes to us to meet this question and that we're not you know it's a great collaboration <laughs> we're always in a great collaboration as you say and every there's uh, much more to teaching and learning than um, the ego, the ordinary ego is is aware of. Mm-hmm. We're in studio today with Nancy Mellon. You're listening to Simple Life on 540 AM KRXA. And how would you describe elder? I know you've been described as an elder. Well, I have come to describe myself as an elder because, because I have this younger picture of me on... A couple so the books that I've published, and I look at that, and I say, no, no, that's not really quite honest about the way I look right now and uh, my age. So, I I think it's only right that I should uh, claim my age. So, 
So I call myself an elder now. Well, I think you're you're also a sage yeah. and a wisdom carrier. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, elder is much more than older. It's um, the wealth of your experience that you hold and radiate and imbue on those who are willing to accept it. Yes, you are requesting. And like the little ones are always looking to their parents as role models for how to be a human being for better and for worse, you know? So when we get old enough, people look to us and they say, well, she she might have something important to share with me. But, you know, in the 20s and 30s, the young people, they will tend to throw out the elders and try to do it themselves. But every now and then, they'll let in an elder. <laughs> <and say so>. <laughs> <laughs> We're in studio today, if you're just joining us, with Nancy Mellon. We're in studio today with Nancy Mellon. You're listening to Simple Life on 540 AM KRXA. I wondered if you have a memory of a particularly important mentor in your life. Oh, my there there are a number of these uh, very dear souls. Uh, I grew up without grandparents uh, on either side. They were not available and they were they had already died and and so it was it was such a great joy to me in my twenties when um, I met an older woman who was a mentor, and I kind of adopted her mother as my grandmother. Mm. And uh, I, every now and then I had the privilege of visiting her. And she was, in her way, a creative genius. And she worked with, among other things, she worked with glass. And she had a kiln, and um, she would make these marvelous forms, butterflies and birds and all kinds of forms, and place the colored glass in those. And then she would cook them overnight in the morning. It was her great joy to emerge and go to her kiln which had cooled and open the door and see what she had cooked over the night <laughs> uh, and they were always sparkling with light and she would hold them up to the light and I thought that is a very good way to live mm. to be in such a marvelous creative collaboration with the natural world that weaves with the light you know so she was a wonderful mentor for me she she loved life she lived to a very ripe old age, and she was creative up to the last, and uh, probably still is, you know, I mean, <laughs> some way or other. But a, a, a great storytelling mentor to me was Brother Blue, who is, was surely one of the great storytellers of the world, who uh, used to, um, used to uh, tell his stories on the curbs at, in Cambridge, Massachusetts for many, many years. I mean, he also was around, uh, traveled immensely, but um, he's an extraordinary soul. He just beyond genius fellow, whose great story was the story of the transformation of the, of the grub into a glorious butterfly. Mm. And when he was out, um, he and his wife would always decorate him in the mornings after he had dedicated his first water and his little bit of bread, which he generally didn't eat and drink very much, but he would dedicate them to storytelling to change the world. And then he would go out, and she would go to work at the library. She is working uh, um, in the library, and he would be on the street corner telling, bringing these stories to anyone. And... Um, uh, his repertoire was so amazing. Brother Blue, you can look him up, anyone who's listening. You'll see there's a great uh, book uh, created by one of his students, Warren Lehrer, uh, which is just called Brother Blue. Um, but Brother Blue is a teacher to many, many, many of us in the storytelling world. Um, his uh, soul and his spirit were absolutely alive. And he uh, he never turned anyone away from his from this great art of storytelling. He was always listening to the story as you do, mm. and uh, so um, he was very, um, if I may say so, Christian in that sense, or that. 
the uh, the down and outers, the homeless and their stories were just as precious to him as any other stories from the, you know, the Harvard professors and all the rest of that. He had it all in his grasp and with great love and great understanding. And and uh, uh, he, when he's he and his wife, I, I I heard this about the Ruth. His wife told me they were on their way to. They they had five blocks to walk to the grocery store to get their food. And so they would set off in the morning. And she said they would get home uh, late in the afternoon because <laughs> because Blue would tell a story to every, every, about and to everything. He met the dogs, the pregnant mothers, the the um, the homeless, of which there were plenty in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the students, the storytelling crowd that would come around sometimes. Um, everybody got stories. First time I met him, he told me the whole of King Lear in the back seat of a rainy car going from Cambridge over to Boston to this event. He told me in jive talk the entire essential plot line of King Lear in such a way that I was in, it was pouring rain outside, that I was just crying with the astonishment that any human being could do this thing. And so he, he is so far beyond my capacities and all of our capacities. He's uh, so highly developed in that way, but he is a tremendous uh, inspiration and uh, great humility. I would say he definitely a mentor to myself and mm. many others. And yep, there are many others. <laughs> We're in studio today with Nancy Mellon, psychotherapist and author, uh, storyteller at large, and just having a wonderful conversation. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with more from Nancy Mellon on Simple Life. <laughs> Magic dragon lived by the sea, singing and frolic, frolic in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. Little Jackie, little. Nancy, the other question that I had for you was, it seems that your your background and your work is so broad and diverse uh, that it causes me to wonder if there weren't some specific situations or turning points that had you branch out from one to another. So I know that's a very broad question. but Well, I could tell you one of those turning points. I, for many years, I worked with painting and drawing, teaching people to open up to the world of color. And I gave, I don't know, countless classes to help people find their way through the color world to better family relationships, to see their children more through the, the lens of color, and to understand their interactions in their family group through color as the, the translator. And so, and at a certain point I said, I think I've done enough of these. I, I couldn't even count how many. I mean, you know, hundreds of workshops and sessions and so forth. And, and then the vision came to me. I think I'm now going to let go of all the paints and the crayons and the paper and all the material things, and I'm going to now. And I felt called to it, really, to bring all of that color activity and wisdom that lives in the color world, and I'm going to bring that into words and into the story process, into the poetic and streaming of language as a healing and a helping. And I remember that day, and I thought, oh... I had this vision of a, a great rose, and I was going to try to paint this rose. And I said, no, you don't have to paint it. It's there. And I said, that's the rose of the heart. That's the heart that will guide all this work. And so that's the way it's been. Yeah. We started uh, getting your perspective on the pioneer work, actually, that you're doing with language and storytelling and healing. And I, I wonder if you have, if you've read any of Stephen Hawkins' work, uh, Power Versus Force, where he talks a lot about vibration of emotion. Mm. And I know that color also is measured in vibration, as is language. Yeah, yep. every word, every word. I have read some of his um, wonderful uh, explorations of how to identify these different 
qualities of where we are in this great scale of emotions and how to be able to move more freely. Another wonderful resource, in addition to his, is uh, is the work of Masaru Emoto, mm. uh, who uh, experimented with words and water. And when we think that the human being is at least 70% water, some of us carrying more, considerably more than that, that we are water beings, that our whole body is a listener to every word, for better and for worse. You know, the news is, is gripping and hammering on our nerves and our cellular structure in its way. And a story lovingly told, uh, a wise story, even with some very difficult episodes within it, will work upon us in extraordinary ways. And that, that's uh, that are positive and that take us in the direction of life rather than the other way. So we, our whole body, our whole being is a listener. So it's good to have Masaru Emoto's uh, books in mind and just say, this is so awesome that my whole being is so responsive to the words in my environment and the way that they are spoken. Oh, my heavens. <laughs> Dr. Emoto's first book, I believe, was uh, Messages Hidden in Water. Yes. We're in studio today with Nancy Mellon. You're listening to Simple Life on 540 AM KRXA. I'm one of those few people, I'm told uh, one in 250 people don't have TV. And so we haven't had TV for um, six, going on seven years now. And I remember before we gave up TV, really it was more of a practical issue, I think, just meaning we worked so much we didn't have time. However, um, TV offers so much programming. And a lot of the programming, maybe the majority of it, is focused around marketing. And I believe that we don't often differentiate when we're listening that this is a marketing program. And, the, and as you said, we're always listening. We're always impressionable. Um, this is how the money is made. I'm, I'm changing now in terms of how I'm listening. Let's say I'm in the car driving and I have the radio on. If there's something on the radio that isn't making my body feel good, if I'm really not interested or it doesn't feel right, I'll change the channel. Bravo. And that's a freedom that we all have. You know, a lot of a lot of folks that I interact with have a, a much more fatalist attitude about the world. Well, you know, it just gets worse all the time. It's not going to get any better. Um, I I can't do anything about it. And and my heart goes out to them, in their sense of overwhelm that they would have that approach or that perspective. But honestly, as we can pick what book we want to read from the bookstore. Or, as you said, stories we want to tell. Can't we also pick what stories we want to hear and have some filtering responsible for those boundaries? Don't you think? Absolutely. And this discernment in our listening, I think it, it comes when we have allowed ourselves to honor the sensitivity that is within us as human beings and, and, and given ourselves permission to say no that doesn't as you say that doesn't make me feel good what's going on here um, the analytic mind I think I think children should learn how you know, certain keys to analyzing what is manipulation and really understand that manipulation and that if I were teaching now um, just as you know, when I was growing up, it was learning how the war slogans were manipulations back in the uh, to be awake to you know how how Hitler you know got had his way so to speak. Uh, this awakening to how words can be used to manipulate our feelings, our thinking, our emotional world, our convictions. Uh, to learn discernment and to remember inner freedom to say yes or no to that. I think that's my work is very much about that. Actually, at this point, with all the work that I did for the book called Body Eloquence, if I turn on the radio, I can tell this person is speaking 
primarily out of his brain. He's speaking out of his stomach. He's speaking out of his intestinal world. He's speaking from his heart, thank God. Or she, you know, and uh, it, that that can, uh, the, the ears can learn to identify the, prim- the primary intention behind the word. And to me, it's absolutely important for children to be learning that mm-hmm. and to be learning the power of no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're here in the studio with Nancy Mellon on Simple Life, and uh, we're speaking with her about the power of story, amongst other things. So, Nancy, you're you're sharing the absolute critical nature of having a child develop an analytical skill to be able to differentiate. Maybe an uh, easy way of saying this is differentiate truth from false, or the intentions of the behind message. the word the, the intentions behind the words i think working with the younger child that they can learn to recognize that mm-hmm. and with the older children that they can actually you know, practice manipulative language themselves and learn how you do that and then s- decide whether that's what they want to do or not so to basically become conscious of the skill mm-hmm whether they're using it or it's being used and the, on them. And the effects and of the it. Effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a, a wonderful attitude, certainly an empowered attitude to go about your navigation with education. You know, one of the great I think one of the great responsibilities of the of today's teachers is to is to truly help children in that discernment. But I think the discernment comes, is very helped when children have had a beautiful, nutritious environment of wise and lovingly told stories, because then when they hear something which doesn't feel right to them, that they, they can say, well, w- what is this? This, this, isn't, this doesn't feel like a life story. This is something else going on here. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's somebody's, you know, somebody's money-making scheme. But they're not saying that up front. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get me to do something. Oh, wow. Well, listen to that. Oh, you know, so there's a natural discernment that they develop when they have had, as they are surrounded by wisdom speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you would be willing to share with us your favorite book of all time. Oh, my favorite book of all time. Gosh, uh, what would that be? Hmm. Surprise question. I could I could say my favorite book right now. Okay, let's... Can, can I do that? Oh, please. Yeah, because uh, I have been working with the uh, great myth of the Iroquois nation. Hmm. And I believe this is the most important story for us to be carrying in our nation right now. Actually in the world, but particularly in America, because... This saga, which is called the Saga of the Peacemaker, was built right into the foundations of our Constitution. Benjamin Franklin came and consulted with the Iroquois elders as mentors for building a form of government that would be lasting. This is the story of the warring nations who had been warring a very long time, who were really lost in violence. And then there came to them the peacemaker. And he taught them methodically and patiently. And he had an amazing stutter, but he was able to gather around him the helpers who understood his mission. Gradually, they were able to learn that the way to uh, true uh, human relations is through listening and through speaking in such a way that our words are speaking through the ages. Not for our, you know, not for all these other reasons that we can, we can identify, and that they are there to serve life for all of the tribes, mm. rather just for one's own personal agenda. So a win-win situation. So instead to- of a no, lose. Yes, all the way around. So they were able, as a whole network of tribes, to come into this what they called the new mind. And the new mind became then the primary working mind for the whole group. And they changed everything then. 
And so this has been worked with very thoroughly and conscientiously by Jean Houston. The book that I work from mainly is the the Manual of the Peacemaker, mm. which Jean Houston put together a number of years ago, um, where she tells the whole story with the permission of Orrin Lyons, who is the primary story keeper for the Onondaga Nation now. He's a wonderful soul. And... Um, so uh, but I work with it very, very, very respectfully because I grew up right there in the on it, by the at the edge of the Onondaga territory, mm. and um, so that is my favorite, favorite tale. She has worked with it. She's working from primary resources, which are listed in her bibliography for the Manual of the Peacemaker, and I have a friend who's a marvelous puppeteer, and um, next summer we are going to put on a conference with uh, puppet making and work our way through this great myth, a powerful, powerful, powerful myth of the transformation of the heart, mind of the whole nation. Mm -hmm. And if I remember the story correctly, the turning point, finally, the climax was when the arch villain, Tadadaho, was actually healed from all of his grief. They became strong enough as a group because not one person could do it, but they, there was a whole group. Amongst them was the, the medicine woman who had been working to create the herbal unguents that would support this whole intention to heal and transform the darkest member of the group. And that is very important because he was a most horrifying villain and, and bully, and he was teaching others as a mentor how to be a horrifying, terrifying bully, and um, how to be secretive, and how to be all the things that we see in our nation now, how to be those things, because they people have been taught to be those things. And so this other group who had developed the new mind, had developed the forebrain, the neocortex, in ways that were sublime and wise, they were able as a whole group to develop the power to go right into that darkness and to transform it. Mm -hmm. There is another book um, called The White Roots of Peace. Yes, yes, and of course she, Jean Houston, worked very much from that, Uh and we were we will be, next summer we'll be working from that. Oh, nice. And then a children's book version called the Peace Walker. Oh, I haven't seen that. I would yeah. love to see that. Do you yeah. have it in the bookstore? We do from time to time. Yes, it's a oh. it's a love of ours as well. It it has been for many many centuries amongst them, their sacred myth that upholds the Longhouse tradition. Mm-hmm. And so when they when in any in all the tribes all over the all over the world where the 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 primary myth is told, that helps them to live in safety together. That they um, uh, then they bring this at a special time of the year. Sometimes only once every three years they will bring the story that re that reinstates the the heart and soul of the nation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it brings a unity yes. back to their nation that connects them both to ancestral connections as well as future generations. Yes. Yes. And wasn't that, I mean, the Iroquois, didn't they take on the name of the Iroquois at a turning point yes. in their history? That's when they came together, then they uh, developed that as their unifying name, which was a really important step for Beautiful. them. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. So my final question is about a book that has particular meaning or value to you. Uh, I would like uh, to speak about Mary Oaks. New new book which is just fresh from the press. Is this someone that you knew? I do. Kn- I know Mary, and she's a a very dear dear soul. I wish you could speak with her directly. She lives in Seattle. This book is uh, her recounting. She's a, already a very skilled uh, poetess and and writer. And but when she had this very, very stunning experience, to say the least, of having a heart attack as she was rushing in the airport to catch up with her beloved so that they could get to Paris on time. And the heart attack was so uh, profound that she actually was pronounced dead. But the the fire department arrived on the scene as quickly as they could, and with these enormous paddles, they brought her heart back. And then as she regained her consciousness, her her beloved uh, with her at all times, uh, David, she began 
to write to keep her sanity and and to remind herself of who she is and what she was experiencing. And so this book, Hearts Oratorio, is the testament to her courage to accept every experience that she had after she came back to life and to write about them as beautifully uh, as she could. And so this is one woman's journey through love, death, and modern medicine. Anyone out there who's listening who is challenged with uh, a major health issue, who may be uh, finding your way through the thorny thickets of the medical world in order to um, uh, get some inspiration, you might want to read this book as soon as possible. (laughs) And we will have uh, access to this book at our store, Pilgrim's Way Community Bookstore and Secret Garden. Just give us a call, 831-624-4955, and we'll help you out with that. Good. It's, it's Mary Oaks, Hearts or Oratorio, One Woman's Journey Through Love, Death, and Modern Medicine. Wonderful. Well, I could talk to you forever, Nancy. It's um, been such a delight to have you as a guest on Simple Life. I mm-hmm. hope you come back. Oh, thank you. I would love to. It's such a pleasure to speak with you, and, uh, and uh, thank you for the privilege. Absolutely. On the magic We are here with our surprise guest, Miss Isabella Ball. Hi, Bella. Hey. And uh, usually, when we're when we're here on Simple Life and we have a book review from Bella, she has already pre-recorded it because of schedule. I don't have the opportunity to have her here on a Saturday afternoon, but for today, schedules changed, and she has chosen um, a particular book for our book review on Simple Life. So which book have you chosen? I chose the book The Noddles, written by Nancy Mellon, illustrated by Ruth Lieber. Ruth Ruth Lieberer. Ruth Lieberer. And why did you choose this particular one, Belle? Well, for this show, we were doing Nancy Mellon, so since she wrote this book, I thought it would be a good opportunity. I like that. And can you tell us a little bit about the story? Well, there's these kids who make, who are waiting for their house to be built. And when their house is done, it's a tradition to put the topmost part of the tree on the top, on top of the house. So the trees that are cut down and used to build the house? Is that where yeah. they... Yeah. Okay. And so when the house... And they play for a little while and have dinner. And so then they, the, the little girl's playing on her bed and the little boy's playing on his bed. And when they go to sleep, these little noddles come out. No, what's a noddle? It's like... It's a little pine tree baby. And where do they come from? They come from the knots in the wood oh. of the house. So they come out when the kids are sleeping? They come out at night. Not necessarily when the kids are sleeping. Should the children be scared? No. They're cute little pieces of wood. <laughs> and what happens? Well, they sing by the campfire and look in an, at an ancient scroll, and they have to eat, well, to drink, they have acorn tea, and to eat, they have little cakes. And um, so, Nados live in the pine knot eyes, guardians of branching places in our trees, springtime replaces. In our trees, springtime replaces. A new room for the children's sake. Let seedlings rise. That's a little chant they like to say. So. So how does it end? Well, they dream of the noddles also, and they ask their parents if they can plant a pine a pine tree. 
and so they plant a pine tree and so and the pine tree grows and they take care of the pine tree and a little hint you can on every page including the cover of the book except for not the back of the book but the cover and the rest of the book has the l little noddles out on it so, so you keep, can see what they look like yeah so keep an eye out cool that's awesome did you have uh, any kind of a learning message in that story or not really well i thought it was really cool when you were telling us about it that the children once they got sort of aware of the noddles they built a tree for the noddles to live in because they were living in what used to be the tree the noddles lived in yeah i like that that's awesome okay and it looks like you have another book yeah it's called yeah it's called the magic boots um this little boy he lo he he just loves these boots because they can take him anywhere he goes to the Amazon River. He goes canoeing down the Amazon River, and he goes sometime. And when he feels like it, since he loves, he's always wanted to be a cowboy. He goes to ca to corral some cattle. I forget where, but um. So one day, the most tragic things. Happen thing happens. No, no. His feet can't fit in the boots anymore. I bet you know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> and so he, what happened is he um so he, he's moping around all day. He's so sad, feeling sorry for himself. He thinks oh, all this places I'll never be able to go again. I felt sorry too, but... So what happens? Then he goes to sleep. And he just and when he wakes up, he's in a place again and he's he thinks interesting. So, he looks down and it's just his regular feet and he thinks it's me. Wow. It wasn't the boots. No, it was him. Wow. That's a cool story. That's lots of adventure in there. Yeah. And so, how about this story? Is there anything that, you know, it kind of tells you about life or is trying to tell you? The moral of this story is you have more power than you think you do. I think that's true. That's definitely true. So, we, uh, we have that bookstore down in downtown Carmel, Pilgrim's Way Community Bookstore in Secret Garden. Drop in and see us sometime. Bella sometimes helps out in the garden. We were doing that today. And uh, we have events pretty regularly. In fact, during the summer, I mean, we didn't plan this, but there's an author with their book um, on site usually every Saturday for the next month or so. Um, so if you want to know what is planned, uh, there's a few ways to find out. You can check out our Facebook page, Pilgrim's Way, and uh, we have things listed there under events, usually about a month in advance. There's also a printout of the email announcement that we send uh, to our subscribers that we um, post at the community board inside the front of the store. And then there's also you know, email, obviously. We've, we've gone paperless since we uh, became a green certified business in 2009. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> so uh, we're happy to get the word out. We do notify the local papers, and, and sometimes they have room in calendars and, and can write articles as well. And we really appreciate the support we get in that way to get the word out. Um, there is... Uh, there's also a lunchtime discussion group each week, and a lot of people who live or work nearby um, can come on in and just between the hours of 12.30 and 1.30 have a seat. You can bring your bag lunch if you want and have great conversation around the table with other cool local people. So keep that in mind. Uh, there are various days throughout the week and, uh, and topics as well. So... Um, that uh, That is always keeping us busy, 
at the bookstore. That sounds fun. Even I'm a kid and I get bored easy, so I think it might be really, really fun to do. Yeah. Well, you know, during the summer, you're not going to be in school. Yeah. So maybe you could come down, have your own sort of uh, lunchtime discussion group. What do you think the subject might be? Uh, uh, horses, maybe? Horses. Do you know a thing or two about horses? Oh, yeah. Care to share any uh, little tidbits with our listeners? Well, um, well, this is kind of c- common knowledge, but horses can be real dangerous. How so? Well, if you spook them and you're behind them, you'll get kicked. Oh. And that hurts. How do you know that? Well, someone's done. I've seen, well, not seen it, but I've heard it. Yep. And they're really heavy, so don't let them step on your toes. They're very heavy. Do you know about how much they weigh? Uh, I think they're like 500. That would be a very skinny, skinny horse. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Okay. (laughs) But they're certainly big. Yeah. They're very big. And so these dangerous creatures, how come you like them? They're really fast and strong and beautiful. Yeah? Have you had much experience with strong and beautiful horses kind of not yeah. a ton but kinda. so you've you've ridden on them that's how you know they're yeah. fast yeah. yeah and you didn't get bucked off or fall off nope i've never had a bad experience with a horse i think that's one reason that i really really like them yeah i've never had a bad experience with one well i hope it stays that way yeah yeah and i i happen to know that you really want a horse Oh, yeah. (laughs) And you have a few different colors of horses picked out. Black with white, um, with a white star, white with a black star, chestnut with a dark bay star, um, dark bay with a chestnut star. That's a a a lot of horses, Bella. Regular star. Yeah. And all that. Yeah. So every horse with the all the other color stars. <laughs> and uh, that must be one reason you liked this Magic Boots book, because there's a bucking bronco on the cover. Yep. Yep. That's one reason I liked it. So um, is there anything in our last final minute you'd like to share with our listeners about the family business or... Um, you know, kids' perspective of the store? Well, they, they have movies and books for young adults, so teenagers, probably like 18 and under to like something like that. And they have a children's section. And That's where you hang out. Yeah. Well, I hear our friend Casey Abrams singing our favorite song. Do you hear that song? (laughs) Thank you, everybody, for listening in. We look forward to our next time with you on Saturday, 4 to 5 on 540 AM, Simple Life. Love it.